Well, again, good to be with you this morning. It is always a bit of a challenge when you take a section, especially out of the book of Luke. Luke likes to write. He writes long books, and sometimes he takes his time in making his points. I think I told you last week, as we were entering into Luke chapter 8, essentially what we could do is we could take the two points I had last week, and what we could do is we could add today's message to it, and that would be point three. Okay, so today, in many respects, is part two of last week, but that's okay. I'll try to group those together. Is that all right with you? So, well, that's what's going to happen, so it's, it's how, it, how it is. Okay. I want us to go back. Why don't you turn to Luke chapter 8. If we go to Luke chapter 8, and our main section for today is going to be Luke chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 26. We're going to go all the way through verses, uh, to verse 39. However, uh, we have to pick up the context of what we've been talking about. And if we go to Luke chapter 8, and we pick it up in verse 19, we see that Jesus is going to make uh, a statement which is quite extraordinary, followed by an act which is also quite extraordinary. We come to the 19th verse, and in the 19th verse, just in summary, what happens is that we have Jesus' mother, Mary, the brothers of Jesus, they have come. The crowd around Jesus is so large, it's so cumbersome, if you will, that they are impeding the way for Mary and the brothers to get into Jesus. So much so that messengers have to be sent to Jesus, saying, hey, your mom and, and your brothers, they're outside, and they want to talk to you. To which Jesus will say, well, um, I am going to redefine the family. Now, he doesn't say this, but that's essentially what he does. He says these words. He says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. What Jesus is doing then is that Jesus is adding a lens, if you will. As we look at the family, we are to look at the family through the lens of who Jesus is. We are seeing here that Jesus is commanding a obedience and authority that is stronger than mom and your brothers. It doesn't make any difference what your family relationship is. Jesus is more important. And we can see this in other verses where Jesus will say, take up your cross and follow me, and you have to hate your mother, and, your, and, and we're like, what is that? And Jesus can say those type of things because it is a comparative, that is, you must love Jesus more than anybody else. Amen. That's a pretty tough statement, i got to tell you that right now. That is a tough statement because, frankly, when it comes to the fact, boy, I'm going to guard my family, I'm going to guard my family, and something's going to happen to my family, or there's a, a disruption in your life, and it's like, follow Jesus, or go to the one which I see before me, which I, I'm, I love, I love, I love. And what we have here is a command of Jesus, I'm more important. When the rubber meets the road, ladies and gentlemen, that is a very, very, very difficult thing to do. And for you to gloss over it or to think over it and say, well, it's not a big deal, that is as profound as the section which we're going to follow. Jesus is more important than mom and dad or your little boy, or your grandson, or whatever the case may be. More important. And I think if people understood that, they wouldn't be so flippant with the idea of following Jesus. I say that's pretty profound. Well, let's go to another one. Because the second point which Jesus has is we come here to verses 22 through 25. And in 22 through 25, where Jesus is redefining a relationship between how we should see family, now we're going to see that Jesus is going to redefine how we should see the natural world. Because Jesus is going to be upon a boat along with his disciples. They're in the midst of the Sea of Galilee. We know that the storms have come out uh, uh, from the top all the way up Mount Hermon. And here comes the wind, and they're coming down, and they're hitting upon the Sea of Galilee, which is below sea level, and it is hitting it in a, tum in a, in a tumult. It is white capping. You have men who are on board the ship who are professional seamen. They've been around a long time, ladies and gentlemen, and when they think the ship is going to go down, it's going to go down. It's swamping. I have to figure that they've been bailing, they have been throwing everything that they possibly can. Perhaps they're trying to get to a closer shore somehow or another. They've got to figure things out, but they are in the midst of it, and they finally come to Jesus and they say, we are perishing, Master, don't you get it? To which Jesus doesn't do much except say, where's your faith? And he stands and he rebukes the winds and the waves.
We as human beings like to think that we are in control of things, that we can master things, that we can have things in our, our power. We like to think that we can have personal relationships which we can manipulate or we can control. You can talk sweet to your hubby or you can talk down to your children or you can lift somebody up and elevate an employee, whatever the case may be. I'm here to tell you that Jesus is saying, I am the master of relationships and I'm the most important. We like to think that we can change our physical environment, we can change our physical world, and we can manipulate waters, or we can build buildings, or we make things stronger. Some things will never fall, some things will never sink, some things will always be. And what God, ladies and gentlemen, God can change it like that. And Christ is saying, I'm in charge. You need to have a different thinking about family and relationships. You have a, need to have a different thinking about the physical world in which you're in. And now as we come into our passage this morning, what we will see is Jesus is going to say, you need to have a different thinking, a different understanding of how the supernatural works. Really. We come then to Luke chapter 8, and we look then at verses 26. We're going to go all the way through to verse 39 this morning. So Luke 8, 26 through 39 this morning. You may have some abilities. I'm here to tell you that Jesus wants you to see things different. You can perhaps change the physical world a little bit. Jesus is the master. You perhaps can manipulate people and do things in the relationship world. Jesus is the master. and He's the one through whom you must see how things are to be. It doesn't take long, ladies and gentlemen, in the natural world to be shown that you are not in control. It does not. We come to the 26th verse. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. Now let's stop here just because uh, you're going to have footnotes perhaps in your Bible or if you look at a commentary, people are going to say, oh, what in the world is this? And it is all about the word here. We have the word Gerasenes. You're going to see the same word which you're going to see in the book of Mark but you'll see it a little bit differently in Matthew. Matter of fact, I think it's Gadarenes. And people will say, well, which one is right? And there is, a, there is a different city there, and so there's confusion as to what's going on. There's different textual evidence for different words there, so people are confused as to which one's there. But I don't get too concerned about it because it seems to be a generality because it says here that it is in the country. It's in that area. And so, therefore, we're not going to be overly concerned about it. The textual evidence, you get to study that on your own. I'm not going to bore you from the pulpit. But here what we have here is we have Jesus, and he's coming to the other side of the Sea of Galilee into the country, it says, of the Gerasenes. And some of you may say, well, is that legitimate? Can you talk about in the country of? You do it all the time. I do it all the time. When I travel across the country, you're in Texas, you're in Maryland, wherever the case may be, and people ask you, oh, where are you from? You say, oh, well, I'm from, I'm from Washington. Oh, D.C.? No. They have no idea about this state in the corner called Washington. <laughs> Why is that a mystery? I don't understand it, but it seems to be a mystery. I said, no, no, I, I'm from Washington. Oh, 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 okay, no, it's not D.C. And then you know they don't know anything, so you just say, I'm south of Seattle. Oh, okay. It's in the country of. It's the same thing, right? I'm in the country of. If somebody knows something, they say, oh, whereabouts? Then you could say, Tacoma. You do, you, do you ever start off with University Place? No. no. If you start off with University Place, they're like, they're confused. I'm confused. We live in a city which is, the name doesn't make any sense, okay? We don't have a university in University Place. It, 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 <laughs> It's, it's, it's besides the point, but we usually say, well, it's Seattle, but it, or the south of Seattle, and then people say, oh, now I understand. So here we have Jesus, and he's gone into this area. That's perfectly fine. So again, a small point, a minor point, I just saw it, so we're dealing with the text. I want you to understand that. So he's come over here, and he's come over to, this, to the, the area, or opposite country. Uh, he's on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And when Jesus had stepped out on the land, there met him a man from the city who had a demon, for a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out, and he fell before him, and he said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. Now we look at this here. It is interesting for us because Jesus has just crossed the sea. He has just gone ahead 
and he has quieted the winds and he's quieted the waves. And remember the disciples' question? Who is this? Who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Amen. Obey him, by the way. Amen. By the way, it's possible for us to be delusional and think that we can do things with our minds, okay, and not be able to do them. There's a great commercial out there. Uh, I, can't, I think it was for a car commercial. I'm sure it was a car commercial. And there's this little boy, and he's this big, and he's got his Darth Vader outfit on there, and he constantly is trying to move things. Have you seen this? And he's constantly, and it doesn't work, and it doesn't work, and it doesn't work. And then his dad shows up with this fancy luxury car, you know, and the kid goes like this, and all of a sudden the dad says, watch this. And he starts the car with a remote start, and it starts up, and the kid thinks he's got power. Jesus doesn't need a fancy remote. Jesus is in control. He's in control of the wind and the waves, right? He's got it, okay? They obey him. He's not delusional. But what I find interesting, we have that question which is given to us at the end of the, of the small section, 22 through 25, and the final question is this, who is this that controls the wind and the waves and they obey him, they're under his control, and what we find then, it is ironic to me, that the person, or the persons, or I guess they're personal beings, the demons are the ones who are answering the question, are they not? Because look at this, this man, who is full of a legion of demons, runs up to Jesus, falls before him, and it says, Jesus, Son of the Most High God. Whew. Who is Jesus? He is Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. He is important. It is interesting to me that we're getting an answer as to who is Jesus from the mouth of the supernatural. Amen. Now, it's interesting to me. Now, Stay with me, because if we go back to Luke chapter 4, we see that in other times we have other demons which are driven out from Jesus. Or no, I misspoke there. We have Jesus driving out other demons, excuse me. And if we go to 441, what we see is we see the demons there confessing who Jesus is, but he rebukes them. And if you go to 441, and demons also came out, of him, many crying, you are the son of God, but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. What we have here is we have Jesus redefining relationships. We have Jesus redefining how we should understand the physical world. And we have Jesus redefining how we should even understand the spiritual world. He's more important. He's more powerful. He's the one in control. What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? Hm. I beg you, do not torment me. It's interesting for us, as we look here, as Jesus comes eye to eye with the supernatural right before him. By the way, wouldn't <laughs> think about that for a moment. If you're one of the disciples on the boat, and you've got this crazy possessed guy running down to see you. He has no clothes on, right? He's probably not very well shaved, okay? Here comes this crazy, screaming guy coming down, bowing himself before Jesus. My guess is that you would be freaked out. Right? I see no freak out in Jesus. None. I don't see anything. We don't see Jesus blanching. We don't see Jesus taking a step back. We see no fear whatsoever. What we see here is we see Jesus in complete control. Complete control. In the same way when Jesus is on the boat and everybody else is in fear and they're swamping, don't you understand, Master, that we are perishing? Aren't you going to do something? And Jesus says, where's your faith? And he stops it. He's not concerned about the physical world because he is in control. He's not concerned about Mary and the brothers because they're upset because he is in control. He's not concerned when the demon man comes running at him because he is in control. What have... You to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High. I beg you, do not torment me. Don't torment me. Now, why in the world would he say, do not torment me? We don't have a whole lot of experience with the supernatural, that is, with the demon possession outside of Hollywood in 21st century America. What I mean by that is Hollywood makes scary movies, not that they're demon possessed, okay. Well, anyway. But that, but that was what I meant to say. Okay, anyway. Jesus is above the supernatural. So Jesus, don't, don't torment me. Now let's go down to 29 because it kind of goes back and forth here. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of him. 
for many a time it had seized him, and had kept, <clears throat> he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? So what we have here is Jesus is simply, he's going to ask a name. What's your name? Here you got this crazy guy who had been locked up before. He had been able to tear apart his bonds. They had not been able to control him. He had run away. He was hiding in the tombs in unclean places. This was a guy which you were scared of. This is a guy that if you heard him in the middle of the night, you stopped your walk and you got out of there. Because this is, but this is not Jesus. Jesus is not scared. And he says, what's your name? Now, many people say, okay, well, why is the name being asked? It must be because there is a superstition that if Jesus had his name, therefore he had power over him. <laughs> I don't think that's what we have here. Uh, and there is some mythology out there that if you know somebody's names, you have some sort of control. But I don't think that's the point. Jesus is simply asking the name, and I think it's primarily done for the audience. I think it's primarily done and recorded for the audience so we understand what's going on here. This is not one demon. This is not two demons. This is a legion of demons. We have a lot of demons with inside this guy. I don't care how many demons you have. Jesus is in control, essentially, is what we have here. What is your name? And he said, Legion, for, my, uh, for many demons have entered him. Now, notice here the, this man who comes to Jesus, and notice we have a reaction of the demons themselves speaking through the man. We have here the man, he says here, and at the very end of verse 28, he says, I beg you, do not torment me. These guys know what their end is, okay? They understand what their end is. If you go to verse 31, we see what that end is. And they begged, same word, they begged him not to command him to depart into the abyss. They understand that there is no redemption of those who have rebelled against God. They are doomed. Jesus literally could say, go to hell. Good. Jesus could say, go to hell, and they would. Is that? What's interesting to me is that he doesn't. That's the thing which I always found a little bit strange. And many people have questions, why in the world does he take this next step? Why in the world does Jesus not go ahead and send them into the abyss, if you will? And people can say, well, it's not that time. Well, that's true. But I think there's something even a little bit more practical than that. So we have here the man or the demons through the man saying, I beg you. Then they, that is the multitude of the demons, they are begging him not to command him into the abyss. And what we see is that they're going to ask for something, and Jesus is going to grant them something, an unusual request. Now, a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged, that word again, they begged him to let them enter into these, so he gave them permission. They begged him, hey, can we go ahead and do this instead? Question. If you're asking questions of the text, you're asking questions, why in the world doesn't Jesus say, go to hell? Why does Jesus allow them to go into the pigs? People are thinking a little bit. Well, pigs in the Jewish society, they're unclean. And you're not supposed to keep pigs. So uh, Jesus is going to send the unclean demons into the unclean pigs, and that's it. I don't know. We're not certain, certain exactly who these guys are, by the way. Are the Jews or the Gentiles? Well, if they're good Jews, they certainly wouldn't carry, have pigs. It's a Gentilic area, so they're probably Gentiles. But is it, so if Gentiles are carrying pigs, that really is not that big of a deal. What's, why, 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 why is he letting this happen? Why, why does he allow this? Hmm. I think our answer is in our text. Then the demons came out of the manor, entered into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and drowned. I think that's the answer. I think Jesus allows the demons to go out of the pigs so that the demons would go into the pigs. You say, what? Because when the demons enter into the pigs, guess what they do? The demons enter into the pigs and they form this pig stampede and they go running and jumping off of the cliff and into the sea and they begin to float all along the shore. Now, if you want to join, get a crowd. If you want to get a crowd, if I wanted to get a crowd, 
I put a sign out front, I put an advertisement out in the paper or on the internet or whatever the case may be, and I say, see a man cured, and I get half a dozen people show up. I think, oh, cool. If I'm going to get a really big crowd, I put this. Everything that you have invested in, all of your retirement, is floating on the banks of the Sea of Galilee. That's going to get some people out. Now all of this said, and what we see here is what follows is this. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told the people in the city of the country. Then the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. But what they're coming out to see, ladies and gentlemen, is not the man who is healed. They're coming out to see their dead pigs. What do you mean our pigs are dead? What do you mean everything that I've invested in, my thousands, my, everything that I own that is invested in those pigs is floating on the shore? You herdsmen, you lousy herdsmen, you, did, you, you, you must have done something wrong. Oh, my goodness. And you get up there, and you find a bunch of floating pigs. I believe that Jesus allows this to happen because Jesus wants to go ahead and tell these people a few things. He wants them at least to come to a decision. We here have the reaction to Jesus' miracle as we come to verse 34. The herdsmen fled. The herdsmen fled to find out what in the world they should do to go talk to the people because all of their animals were dead. And the people came and they see this man and he's seated. We'll come to him in a second. But we notice here that when they see him, they are, what does it say here? Afraid. We see that the people are afraid. Continue on because I want to pick up another word that describes that crowd. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country and the Gerasenes asked him to depart, for, uh, depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. What we have here, ladies and gentlemen, is they're coming, and they're coming to see Jesus, and they are afraid. They are full of fear. And what are they doing? They are asking. It's interesting to me because in the complimentary passage in the book of Mark, what you'll see is you get the word beg one more time. They were begging Jesus, please get out of here. You are somebody which we cannot control, and we are not interested in you because we cannot control you. If you think that you can put your Jesus, you can put your God in a box and control him, and he's always going to do what I want him to do, you are wrong. Jesus is asking for a redefinition of what it means to be in a relationship. Jesus is asking you to understand that he's more powerful than the natural, and he's more powerful than the supernatural. He is, ladies and gentlemen, incredible. But when we see something like that, we want to control it, and because we can't control it, we are fearful, we are afraid. And the crowd is. The crowd is. Now, not only do we see this, we see that there is a reaction we see that there is a reaction, but we see that there is a reaction by another person. I would like to have seen, by the way, do I see the disciples in here anywhere? I don't see the disciples in here anywhere, but I do see the demon-possessed man, or the formerly demon-possessed man, and I see him. I want to see how he is described. We see the people are afraid. We see a little bit later on in, this, in verse 37 that there's fear. But go to the man who was formerly demon-possessed. We pick that up in verse 36. And those who, oh, excuse me. Uh, those who had uh, seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. So no longer is he demon-possessed, rather he is healed. Then all the people, uh, excuse me, oh, did I miss something here? Thank you very much, I went too, I went too far. I was going to say, that, that's not right. Go to verse 35. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus, and they found the man with whom the demons had gone out. So he's healed rather than the demon-possessed. He is sitting at the feet of Jesus rather than in the tombs. He is no longer in the desert. He is clothed rather than naked. He is in his right mind rather than insane and tearing chains apart. And the people are afraid because this man is a man which is transformed because Jesus has transformed him. Still further, we see a further transformation as we continue on. Jesus, because he's responding to the people, asking him to leave, begging him to leave, he is getting into the boat, assumedly with his disciples. Verse 38, the man from whom the demons had gone begged. There it is again. Notice that you will find the word begged in verse 28. You will find it in verse 30. You will find it in verse 32. 
you will see the word asked, which has the, in, it's inferred here, the idea of, uh, of begging in verse 37, and then finally in verse 38. The man from whom the demons had, got, had begged that he might, uh, <clears throat> the man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much the Lord has done for you. You've changed. Rather than being a screaming maniac, a man out of control, now you are a man in your right mind, and all you want to do now is to follow Jesus. That's it. He wants to follow Jesus. Now, what's interesting to us is we see no is the answer. And Jesus says, no, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. We don't know a whole lot about this man. We know from the complimentary passage in Mark, we know that he goes to the Decapolis, that is the, a series of 10 towns. This is, once again, is a Gentilic area. And here is a guy, and he's going about, and he's telling people, hey, this is what Jesus has done. This is what Jesus has done. It says, and he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. As we come face to face with Jesus Christ, as we are confronted with Jesus Christ, we have to decide what we're going to do with him. And Jesus says, this is what I want done. I want, I want myself, I want Jesus to be more powerful than all of your social constraints. Jesus is more important than your mom. Jesus is more important than your son. Jesus is more important than your little girl. Jesus is more important than anything that you have there, ladies and gentlemen. More important. Well, I don't know if I'm going to obey God or not in this particular thing because that's going to upset somebody in my family. Jesus is more important. He is. Yeah, but I have a good excuse. Really? Well, this relationship's going to be ruined. Really? I know lots of people who will make decisions about relationships based upon what is expedient or about the feelings of other people or whatever the case may be. Jesus says, everything must be in relationship to me. I'm, more, I'm it. We are in a world today where sometimes we think, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do. Things are so difficult for me. Things, things are such a challenge. I have diseases or I have something that is crippling to me or I have financial collapse or whatever. You know what? You serve a Jesus who is in control of all of these things. He just is. That doesn't mean that you're not going to get sick and it doesn't mean that you're not going to die. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus is the one who is in control. He is worth going to, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I struggle spiritually. Well, guess what? Congratulations. We follow a Jesus who is in control. He is the master. We live in an interesting time, ladies and gentlemen. We live in 21st century America, and in 21st century America, there is a, there is a, a try to make everybody of the same level. The beggar is of the same importance as the CEO and the CEO is the same importance of the beggar. You don't really believe that, but that's what everybody says. It is theologically in one sense because they're made in the image of God and all people are therefore valuable, but that being the case, <laughs> we don't take the person who is homeless and make them the CEO. We know that we see instinctively that there are some differences. But we take this concept, this democratizing of, of humanity, and we want to go ahead and add Jesus to it, Jesus to it. And we want to make Jesus one of the guys, like Jesus is part of our bowling team. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus is not your homeboy, and Jesus is not your buddy, and Jesus is not on the bowling team, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus is God most high. And I am here to tell you that, as Paul will write in Philippians chapter 2, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to have an appreciation as to who Jesus is. And Jesus comes and he comes in great humiliation that is true and he dies for our sins. This is true. But he's not just one of us, ladies and gentlemen. He is the one who gave all for us that we might have life. And we need to respect him and worship him and fall at, our feet, uh, fall at his feet. 
This is our Jesus, and he, believe, or he deserves our honor. This is our Jesus. And when we are going through those relational difficulties, or when we're going through the difficulties in this world, whether natural or supernatural, he is still in control. Come to him. Rely upon him. That's what we are called to do. Luke wants us to be assured, no matter what the circumstances, our Jesus is enough. Our Jesus is enough. He will continue on in the 8th chapter, and we will see even more as we come to verses 40 through 56. But once again, we got to get to another sermon. So it won't be next week, by the way, because I'm out of town. So you got to wait two weeks. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a, I'll, I'll go ahead and give away my message. Jesus is enough. He's enough. And he's in control. And he's the one on whom you can rely, ladies and gentlemen. No matter where you're at in this earth, no matter what your circumstance, Jesus is enough. Amen?